All right. It is my fantastic uh, opportunity to introduce Ravid and Jay talking about Bola Buster. All right. All right. Check, check. Everybody hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we are really excited to present in the Upsec Village. And today we are going uh, to talk about uh, Bola Buster, uh, our methodology that we developed uh, in order to automate uh, Bola detection at scale using uh, LLMs. But first, uh, let's introduce ourselves. So my name is uh, Ravid. I'm a security researcher at uh, Palo Alto Networks. I expertise in the WASP field, which is uh, web application and uh, API security mainly. And in my free time, I enjoy watching football games, uh, traveling the world, and uh, take care of my uh, dog, Mabel. Hi, my name is Jay. I am a security researcher with Palo Alto Networks, and my research has been focusing on identifying the threat, the threat and risk in cloud environment. And recently, I've shifted my research focus towards generative AI, in particular, looking into the potentially adversarial use of uh, generative AI. When I'm not working, I spend most of time with my hyperactive twin boys. They behave just like Millions and head off to the parents there with young kids. I know how difficult it is to take care of young kids when, when working. And I'm also a cat lover, so uh, when I'm, I also spend a lot of time scrolling to funny cat video when I'm not working or working. Great, so uh, let's go uh, over the agenda for today. So we are going to cover the concept of uh, BOLA. We will show you our uh, methodology of automating BOLA hunting using LLMs. You are going to see a real BOLA testing that is part of our uh, methodology. And finally, we will see how we, you will see how we hunted down 17 uh, new BOLA vulnerabilities uh, in one of the most uh, popular open source projects out there. And, and yeah. So broken object level authorization, or short for BOLA. Um, so uh, our motivation for the research was pretty huge, I would say. Uh, for those of you who doesn't uh, familiar, who are not familiar with BOLA, it is ranked at the top uh, risk at the OWASP API uh, top 10. And it is also the fourth most uh, reported uh, vulnerability in Hacker One. So it's really popular and it's really severe. And yet, there is no uh, automation tool that can actually and reliably uh, detect BOLA at scale. So this, uh, all of this was a big reason for us to try to solve basically an unsolved uh, issue today. And let's uh, understand first what is exactly BOLA. So if you take a look at this uh, example, we have a patient, uh, we have a clinic application and we have a patient that can query his visit ID and get his doctor notes. Pretty straightforward. But what would happen if this patient would decide to act maliciously and try to uh, fetch another visit ID that does not belong to him? If he would be able to do it, uh, it means that the backend will have an authorization uh, issue. And this is basically a bola. So, um, in a straightforward way, if I can delete or modify, um, let's say, Jay's comment from Twitter or Instagram, this is a clear bola because um, I shouldn't have the permission to access, modify, or delete another user uh, object that does not belong to me. And the consequences can be huge. Uh, it can start from data leaks uh, to data manipulation and even the full account takeover, as we will see today. We faced many challenges when we tried to automate the process of BOLA detection. Um, the first was the complex authorization mechanism. So application these days actually has typically multiple users with multiple roles, with multiple uh, resources. So it's very difficult to say which user can do what, which user is, is allowed to do which action exactly. Um, and this really can get complex. 
Also, applications are stateful today. So each action you make or each API call you, you make can affect the state of the application. And basically each endpoint is dependent on, on one another. So imagine you try to delete uh, a comment from an article or a post. So first you would need to create this post and create a comment for this post and only then you will be able to delete this comment. So they are dependent on each other. You cannot isolate um, uh, one of them. And the execution order is really important uh, in order to not, uh, not have any technical issue. Um, so it, it, it is a big challenge to understand the, these endpoint depend uh, dependencies, actually. Also, Bola doesn't have a, a, there is a lack of vulnerability indicator, basically. So unlike um, XSS or SQL injection, which is pretty straightforward um, to recognize the pattern of the payload, uh, Bola is a logical error. So it's not uh, really malicious by definition. So it's hard to analyze and understand whether it is a Bola or not. And lastly, the context. So, um, we try to understand which endpoint in the application and which parameter contains sensitive data. Um, and it's not that easy to understand it. Um, and also um, to understand what is the impact, actually, of each action that we can take in the application. So all, all of, the, of this was uh, pretty, um, pretty big challenges that we faced during uh, the process. Thanks, Ravi, for covering the background. I hope everyone understands why automating data uh, bola detection is difficult. So it was only two years ago that we realized that AI may be able to give this problem a glimpse of hopes. Uh, because of the recent advancement of AI, uh, we were provided with new tools to solve the problem that were not possible to solve in the past. So, and also in particular, uh, our challenge of extracting context and logic information from textual data aligns well with the capabilities of large language model. So that's the start of our journey in using AI to solve BOLA detection. Here's a high level overview of our methodology. The only required input of our methodology is an open API spec or a Swagger spec. The first stage identify the endpoint that can be vulnerable to BOLA. Not every endpoint can be vulnerable to BOLA. We use AI to help analyze every endpoint and its parameters to determine to select a subset of endpoint as our target. This step help us uh, narrow down our target endpoint and avoid wasting time on the endpoint that are not at risk. We call this endpoint as potentially vulnerable endpoint, short for PVE or target endpoint. We'll, we will refer to this endpoint as target endpoint or PVE in, in the rest of the talk. The next stage uncover the dependency relationship between endpoint. Modern web applications are complex, typically one endpoint depending on many others. For example, in order to test an endpoint that update an invoice, you first need to call the endpoint that create the, the, the invoice. And in order to create an invoice, you first need to call the endpoint that create the transactions that can be included in the endpoint. As a result, it is crucial to understand the endpoint that my target endpoint depend on before I can accurately test it. With the endpoint dependency relationship identify the next stage, calculate the execution path to each target endpoint, and create a test plan for each target endpoint. The next stage then transform the test plan into multiple executable batch scripts using large language model. There may be one or multiple execution path to each target endpoint, and we aim to cover as many paths as possible. Finally, we set up a target API server and run all the test script generated in the previous step. The process of user registration, user login, and token refresh have all been automated. 
And we also use AI to help analyze the response and logs produced during the test. Let's dive into a little bit more detail in each stage. In the first stage, we try to identify the endpoint with input parameter that reference private, sensitive, or confidential information. These are the endpoints that we target. These are our target endpoint. For example, let's look at the first endpoint. The username here indicates that the endpoint may reference to data associated with the indiv individual. If this endpoint is vulnerable, vulnerable to BOLA, an attacker may be able to reset another user's password. Similarly, the second, if the second endpoint put user email is vulnerable to BOLA, an attacker may be able to change another user's email. Traditionally, pen tester manually look for this endpoint and their parameters to determine their target endpoint. This process is slow and cumbersome, especially for very large applications with hundreds of endpoints. So we use AI's capabilities of reasoning and understanding text to automate this step. Here is a snippet of our prompt that show how we teach AI to recognize parameters that may reference to sensitive data. Essentially, we instruct AI a set of rules and examples. At the end, AI returns us the endpoints and parameters that meet any of the conditions that we provided. The next stage uncovers the dependency relationship between endpoints. As I mentioned, due to the complexity of modern web application, each API call may change the state of the application and affect the outcome of other API, on, other API endpoints. As a result, it is crucial to identify their dependency relationship before we can test them. In this diagram, we call the endpoint on the right as consumers and the endpoint on the left as producers. Producer endpoints output the values that consumer endpoints need as input. Again, producer endpoints output the values that consumer endpoints use as input. This is one of the most important concepts in our research, in our methodology. Let's look at this endpoint as an example, delete, common, uh, delete user. In order to correctly test this endpoint, we need to feed it with an existing username. If we feed it with a random variable, a random username, this endpoint will always, the API call will always fail and give us meaningless result. That's why we need to identify its producers. In this case, this consumer endpoint has four producers and each of them can output the existing username that the endpoint can use. Here is a snippet of the prompt that we use to teach AI how to recognize dependency relationship. I want to emphasize that also we can use heuristic algorithm to match the output parameter name of an endpoint with the input parameter name of a consumer. This heuristic algorithm is not reliable. The reason is that developers sometimes use different parameter names to reference the same data object within the system. Developer may also use the same parameter names to reference different data objects across the system. That's, that's why we use a combination of heuristic and AI to uncover the dependency relationship. We, re, we need AI to analyze each endpoint functionality in order to re-establish their dependency relationship based on their functionalities. Once we have the, using the dependency relationship uncovered in the previous stage, this stage build up a dependency tree for each potentially vulnerable endpoint. 
In this dependency tree, the root node represents our one of our target endpoint or PVE. And any two directly connected nodes in a tree represent a consumer and producer relationship in which consumer uh, the, the parent node is the consumer and the child node is the producer. Let's use the upper half of a tree as an example. In this case, endpoint is a producer of PVE endpoint output the value that PVE need as an input. And endpoint one itself also has two producer, endpoint three and four, which produce the output that endpoint one need as the input. Finally, in the next stage, we turn, we, we calculate the execution path to, to each potentially vulnerable endpoint. So in the dependency tree, a path from the leaf node to the root node represent an execution path. This is a reverse tree traversal. So the path is fr actually from the leaf node to the root node instead of from the root node to the leaf node. And let's plug in some real endpoint to see how we do the calculation. In this example, the target endpoint is delete comment. And this endpoint has two producers, get comment and post comment. And these two producers in turn also each has two producer. So at the end, there are four execution paths that can all reach the target endpoint, delete, comment. In the last stage, we then turn each execution path into an executable bash script using large language model and run, and run the script to actually send HTTP request to the target endpoint. The process is more complicated than just generating and sending the request, as Ravid will explain in the next few slides. Uh, great. Thank you, Jay, for uh, the overview of our methodology. And before we can see actually a real BOLA test and uh, view our uh, BOLA that we found, let's see uh, the prerequisites that we have before we can create an, an actual test. So we use LLMs again to create the user registration process and to collect the login data of the application. So basically we generate user LLM generates user credentials that meets the criteria in terms of the, for example, password complexity and ETC. And we execute the user registration process and we fetch the login data from the spec. So this is crucial in order to then um, log in the users of the specific test and get a, a, a valid and unique token for each one of them. Um, this information will be stored in a dedicated file, so we will have an uh, easy access and usage. Then we will want to isolate the test data. So if you uh, ever saw a Swagger or open API spec file, um, you know that it can be huge. It can be thousand lines of code, um, especially for the, biggest, for the bigger applications. And we want to isolate the, only the data that is needed for the specific test. So Jay mentioned that we have a consumer and producers in each test, so we would like to have only the data which is relevant um, to these endpoints. Uh, so we will create a new file, we will feed it to AI, and it will save us about 90 to 95% of the, of the spec. So we do it for efficiency, um, to ensure that uh, LLM will get only the accurate data that it actually needs for each test creation. And for cost, we want to have as, as lowest uh, tokens uh, as we can. And finally, uh, we're creating the test uh, script. Um, it will be saved as an executable bash script. You can see um, an example of a very simple um, consumer and producer. We have a put a user password and a get user to get the username. This kind of test will be saved in a put get directory. Put would be the parent, get will be the child. 
And the test generation actually runs asynchronously in order to save time. And right now we averaged a 1.5 uh, second for each test creation. Right, so the final step would be the, to actually uh, run the, the test script in the application. Um, so we have an execution order um, and our main goal is to avoid any chance that a test would fail due to technical reasons. So we want the test to fail only if the PVE is not vulnerable to BOLA, as it should be. So we will first run the test that populate data and resources to the application before we can fetch them. And also we will try to push and delete, to, to push update and delete operation to the end. So we won't um, experience a scenario where we delete a user or delete a resource and then try to fetch it. So again, the main, re the main reason for this is, is um, not to have technical issues in a test that will make it fail eventually. So right after we uh, f uh, finished our preparing our methodology, uh, we wanted to evaluate our uh, um, Bola Buster actually and see the result. So what we did is we took the, maybe the best API fuzzer, uh, which is open source right now, which is Restler. Uh, Restler is a Microsoft developed API fuzzer. You can find it on uh, uh, GitHub. And its goal is to automate the process of uh, um, API testing and to find um, vulnerabilities like our goal. So what we did is we took free uh, open source application which are deliberately uh, vulnerable to the OWASP API top 10. We took Vampy, Capital, and Crappy. Uh, you can see from the table that they have uh, a known bolas. And we started to test our tool against the uh, wrestler. As you can see, wrestler could not identify any bola of, this, of, of these applications. And it made a pretty big number of API calls, um, thousands and even hundreds of thousands. Then we tested our tool, again, the same application, and the results uh, were amazing. Uh, I hope you can see, we found all the bolas in each one of the applications, and we made significantly lower API calls. So eventually we made less than 1% of the calls that Wrestler made. So this is a crucial part. Uh, it proved our efficiency, um, and we didn't make if, um, a, a, the application a load too much. Uh, finally, we wanted to have um, a 100% true positive rate. So our goal was to find any bola if there if if it exists in the application. Uh, we we did have some false positive. You can't avoid it. Uh, but again, our main goal was to uh, focus on the, on the true positive rate, which was uh, 100%. Now we can take a look on a real scenario for a Ebola test. Uh, so we have this high level example where first Alice creates an article, then Alice creates a comment for this article, and then Bob will try to delete Alice's comment, which is the PVE. So first, uh, Alice and Bob will log into the system. They will get a, a unique token, which will be saved. Alice will create a new article in the system. We will save the article title. We will do the same with the comment. So Alice will create a comment. We will save the comment ID. And finally, the PVE, the maliciously Bob, will try to attempt to delete Alice's comment. And this scenario can have two results. Um, if it will be successful, we will have a, a potential Ebola for this endpoint. Or if the application uh, can defend the Ebola as well, so it will be forbidden. Let's see the, the actual snippet of our code. So first of all, we will uh, create a, a unique random string each time. So we, we will be able to create an article um, for multiple tests without uh, uh, getting an error that it already exists. So as you can see, we, we make a post request to slash API slash articles. You can see that the, we use user A token, which reference to Halis, and we use the article title as a random string. Uh, 
um, we will uh, save the slug, which is in this case the article uh, title. Next, uh, we will uh, Alice will create a comment. So what's special about this is that if you can, if you take a look at the uh, actual endpoint, you can see that we dynamically use slag. So we saved this parameter from the uh, previous request. Uh, and then we dynamically use it. So now we can reference to it as a, a we can know that this um, resource actually belongs to Alice. Again, we save the comment ID. And then finally, we have the PVE, uh, the delete operation. Um, you can see again that we use slag and comment ID um, that belongs to Alice. And we, the main difference, and that now we use a, the user B token, so now we can identify that this request is made by Bob and not Alice. And lastly, we will check if the test passed. Now, I want to emphasize that actually every BOLA test that we make is, if you think about it, is, it's, it's malicious by definition. The last request, the PVE, will always, we will try to to perform an action that you shouldn't be able to perform, right? Uh, Bob shouldn't be able to, to delete Alice comment. So in case it is successful, um, we can mark this test as at least potentially vulnerable to BOLA before we can make uh, a further analysis and a verification, let's say, in the application context. So you just need to understand that every, every BOLA test is, is malicious by definition. So let's see how we actually hunted uh, some bolas um, in the wild. We have a quick demo of showing uh, the running of the tool. Um, um, so this, this is a, a Python based. And it will, uh, I hope you can see, it's testing each API endpoint. And in case the result is successful, it will mark it with bola found and the uh, actual, actual API endpoint. Um, after this, we will take the list and we'll uh, further uh, analyze it and try to understand if this is a real BOLA or not. So all of these applications, um, it has something in common. We found BOLAs in, in it. Uh, so first of all, Harbor. Um, it is a cloud native container registry. It is basically equivalent to Docker Hub, which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with. Um, it, is, it is a CNCF graduated project, so it's been uh, in the wild for, for a while. It has uh, around 2 million downloads these days, and we actually found, um, this year we found a new BOLA, which we will talk in a bit. And next up, Grafana. It's a data visualization and monitoring tool. Very, very popular. It's being used by 20 million users actually these days and we also found a new bola there and lastly we have easy appointments which is an open source uh, tool um, it has almost 200 uh, thousand uh, downloads and we actually been able to find 15 new bola vulnerabilities there yeah a little bit <laughs> uh, the most amazing thing about it is actually that seven of them are critical. So they got a CVSS of 9.9, .9, which actually allows uh, a, a low privileged user to gain admin access. Remember we talked about compromise? So we have a full uh, application compromise in this case. Let's talk about uh, Arbor vulnerability. It's pretty interesting. So uh, Harbor has uh, projects in it. Um, you can have you can have roles, so you can be an admin, a maintainer, a developer, or a guest. Um, basically, um, we found the vulnerable feature to be the project configuration metadata. So I hope you can see the attributes there for the configuration. Um, basically, um, an admin can change the project to be private, public. You can implement some um, image vulnerability scanning and, and have more uh, power. So Arbo claimed that in the official documentation that only the admin project should be able to, to create and modify these kind of uh, configurations, which, which makes sense. And um, 
Actually, we found out that an unauthorized user can do the same operation. So we tried to play with the roles uh, of the project and we saw that the maintainer, for example, could not make any change via the UI. So this is a maintainer login, uh, which is grayed out. You cannot modify it. But um, maintainer can actually uh, create, uh, delete and modify these attributes via the API. So there is a big discrepancy between the UI and the API behavior. And, and this vulnerability actually uh, creates an extend in, this, in the maintainer privileges. So now a maliciously maintainer could be able to uh, make a private project public, uh, deploy unverified images, and actually control every configuration that, that you can control in, in a project. And as you can imagine, the consequences can be pretty high. So we can compromise the wall integrity of a project and uh, actually the security posture. So how about um, verified, um, that's it, okay. So just would say that Halbo identified this vulnerability and you can find it in their security advisory. We got a CVE and you can check out uh, our blog about it when we technically talk about how we found this uh, BOLA. Thanks. Uh, I will just use the last 30 seconds to share the most important lessons we learned from working with AI. First, AI isn't always the best solution. Solution problem with existing heuristic solutions should not be solved by AI, like uh, sorting, finding trees, or solving equations. Those problems have existing multiple solutions and always use heuristic rather than AI. Second, don't trust, always validate. Blindly trusting the output of AI can be very, very dangerous. So always validate the output of AI before using them or passing them to the next stage. Finally, makes AI's jobs easier. Uh, treat AI like a very capable junior worker who can do simple tasks exceptionally well, but starting can start making mistakes when the job becomes more complex. So when working with AI, it is always a good idea, good strategy to use divide and conquer to simplify its task. And that's, thank you so much.